What's going on everybody? As you can see, God is cooking up something here at Evangel. We just started a new series entitled, Your Table is Ready. I want you to see God in a new way. God is many things, he's a shepherd, but God is also a chef. That word chef means chief. And every great chef has to prepare. I want you to know that God has great things prepared for you. You've got to watch the message in its entirety. God prepares a table for Israel in John chapter six in the wilderness, but he shows up and shows out just like I believe he will do in your life. As always, I wanna thank you for connecting with Evangel Nation, for liking, for sharing, for commenting, for following us on all of our platforms. You are helping us to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out to a world. And listen, man, I pray that God's favor will continue to rest upon you. Listen, I gotta go because it's about dinner time, but until next time, peace. John chapter six, verse one. John chapter six, verse one. Y'all praying for me? It reads like this, it says, sometime after this, Jesus crossed for the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test them, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. I'm going to stop right there for the sake of time and brevity. I want you to hear this, that the subject title for today is Your Table is Ready. Your table is ready. Now, if you know anything about me, there's two things I know a little bit about because I've been around them my entire life. I've been around the institution or the organization my entire life. Church and restaurants. <laughs> Oftentimes, I know more than the waiters or the waitresses that are serving. Because I spent my time in that field. And I'm not new to this. I'm true to it. But sometimes you go to a restaurant that's in high demand. And you have to wait for a season. For a moment. But the best news you can ever hear is that your table is ready. But I realize, like church, sometimes you only see one side of the story. Because when you're in the dining room, you don't really see what's going on in the kitchen. And so there is a term in now, a term that's called mise en place. Mise en place. Uh, mise en place, this is a French term that cooks use. Now, you have to understand um, that cooks and chefs are two different things, but we're going to talk about chefs instead of cooks because cooks work for chefs. And that word chef, it means chief. So the chef many times is the chief of the kitchen. And so this word mise en place, it means a setting in place. That before you ever arrive at the restaurant in the dining area, the cook is already setting aside his ingredients. That before you decide to get in your car and approach the front door, he already knows where he is prepared to serve that night. And it's one of the skills that professional chefs live by and is known as a basic culinary skill. He, only has his, he always has his ingredients and he has his tools ready to prepare the meal. But the process of preparing and cooking a meal 
moves rather quickly. And because he understands that time is of essence, he has to prepare and take the long run or take the long process before they ever show up. This is what God does. The Bible says before the foundation of the world, Christ was slain. In other words, before time was a factor, God had already began prepping for what he was going to do. And because he's prepared, what would take longer in time now takes shorter because he's a cook that is prepared. And so watch this. The reason he starts ahead of time is because he doesn't want to forget any of the ingredients. This is why he serves and starts ahead of time because when you're in the rush, you can forget. And sometimes because we're dealing with pressure, we're dealing with anxiety, we become anxious and we think God should move according to our schedule. But you got to know before your mama met your daddy, God already had a plan and start prepping for this day. This is why nothing you will face will catch God off guard because he was preparing. So while you're in the dining area, perhaps he's already made a way. So he's prepping. He knows what you're going to need. He knows you may need a little bit of strength and you may need a little bit of courage and you may need a little bit of faith. And he's already start preparing these ingredients before you show. This is why God is not just a supplier. God is a provider. Yeah, he start preparing the ram before you thought you needed one because God is faithful. And just like a chef, he's only as good as his organization. He's only as good as his ability to plan and prepare for those that will show up. It saves him time. That's why you can be waiting for something for 20 years and it seems like it happened suddenly because God has always been preparing it. Because God refuses to waste his time or your time. And as Elder Mike was saying, I know some of you in the spirit can smell something brewing in the kitchen um, but you're at your table. Now, when we pick up this text, we understand um, that God is preparing metaphorically a table for Israel. You have to understand this, that God prepares a table. But here's the problem. We don't always like the location of where God prepares the table. We've been asking for a table where we can experience God's provision, but we don't like where God sets up the table. In this passage of scripture, God does not just set up the table anywhere. He sets up the table in a remote place. He sets up the table in the wilderness. Could you imagine that some of your biggest blessings will come in your driest seasons? And the Bible makes it very clear that they are away from resources, but this is where God prepares the table. Some of you feel like you're out on the island, but I want to prophesy and encourage you on today that maybe God puts you there because he's setting up a table for you. And so we see that this text is really giving us a comparison study. That Jesus in John chapter 5 is preaching. And he's saying, I'm for the fulfillment of what Moses talked about. And so he moves ahead. And so every reader will understand that John is trying to set up this argument that Jesus is greater than Moses. And so we have to do a comparison study of Moses and Jesus because Moses, he emerges after 400 years of slavery. Jesus emerges after 400 years of silence. Moses parted seas. Jesus calmed seas. 
There's a comparison, but he's trying to communicate that he's greater than Moses. Moses turned water into blood. Some of y'all going to like this point, but Jesus turned water into wine. You have to understand there's a comparison study that's taking place right here, and Jesus is trying to communicate that I'm greater than Moses. The law was given, but grace came. He's trying to communicate that I'm greater than Moses. Moses was Israel's greatest leader up until Till this point because Moses represented law but he's saying I'm who Moses was pointing to I am the fulfillment of the law and so Jesus is saying you've been waiting for me to come and I want you to know that I'm not just anybody I'm the missing ingredient because when you were eating manna in the wilderness I want you to know that that manna pointed to me because I'm the bread that came from heaven to bring your provision and when you eat of me you won't hunger anymore because I'm able to meet every need you have so what Moses talked about I'm the manifestation and so I'm trying to communicate to you that I'm greater than Moses. And you're about to have a better covenant based upon better principles because I'm greater than Moses. Moses was the first mediator, but Jesus was the final mediator. He was greater than Moses. This is what he's trying to communicate to his people. And this is why he takes them down memory lane because these people have been to the wilderness before. This is not the first time as a people they've gone to the wilderness. And so this is like they Deja vu, and some of you are in a dry season. Let's be honest, this is not the first time you've been in a dry season. That you've been in a dry season before, but this time you're not in the dry season with Moses. You're in the dry season with Jesus. And somehow Israel survived the dry season with Moses. And if Jesus is greater than Moses, you should have the dry season under control because God is powerful and whatever is formed against you will not prosper. Can I help somebody? Somebody feels like you can't succeed because of who left you. But my question is, do you still have Jesus? And if you still have Jesus, he's greater than whatever left you. Look at somebody say, I can live without Moses, but I can't live without Jesus. I didn't say it like you mean it. I can live without Tyrone, but I can't live without Jesus. Don't you make me come down your street. I can live without money, but I can't live without Paul says it's in him we live, we move, and we have our being. And so even though Moses is no longer there, Jesus is trying to prove that I'm greater than Moses that you no longer have. And in fact, Moses' whole assignment was to point to me. So Israel, you shouldn't be panicking because you're in the wilderness when you're in the wilderness with Jesus. Can I preach to Evangel? Evangel, you shouldn't be panicking when you're in the wilderness with Jesus. If I was in the wilderness by myself, I'd be losing my mind, but I'm in the wilderness with Jesus. And when I have Jesus, I have everything I need. I have the mystery ingredient, I have the missing ingredient, and I have the main ingredient when I have Jesus. So Jesus prepares a table in the most awkward of places, the wilderness. Some of you are missing the table God prepared for you because of the location he prepared it for you. Because many of us go to restaurants, not for the food, but for the ambiance. And when the ambiance is not correct, it makes the food taste worse. But you got to get to the point where you don't care what's going on around you. But Lord, if you prepare the table for me, I want everything you have for me. If I got to eat it in a dry place, if I got to eat it in a storm, I don't care. I want everything you have for me. Because sometimes the best of times can happen in the worst of times. 
Am I doing all right? So he sets up a table, table for one in the wilderness. The chef prepares the table in the wilderness. And John writes about this. John writes about this. This is the only story that's told in all four Gospels. Because it's critical to our understanding of who Jesus is. Understand, John looks in retrospect. He's basically saying this. According to verse 6, we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know what we were going to do. We were clueless. But Jesus knew what he would do. Because John is writing his years after the miracle is performed. So he's, res- he's going back down memory lane and looking at things in retrospect. And you can look back over your life and realize that even when you didn't know what you were going to do, when you didn't know how you were going to pay the rent, when you didn't know how you were going to get Medicare and insurance, somehow God knew what he was doing. When you didn't know how you were going to get to work because your gas hand was on E and you didn't have any money in your pocket and somehow God made a way, you didn't know what you were doing, but he knew what he was doing. You remember when you lost that loved one and you thought you wouldn't have any support, but somehow God stepped right in because even though you didn't know what you were doing, he knew what he was doing. And this is what John is saying. Even though Philip was clueless, he knew what he would do. And can I prophesy to somebody right now that no matter what you're facing, God knows what he's going to do? I know you've been walking the floor trying to figure out what you're going to do, but God already knows what he's going to do. Who wouldn't serve a God like this that already knows what he's going to do? This is why he doesn't speed to get to Mary and Martha's house because he already knows what he's going to do. And while you're trying to figure it out, can I have a preaching moment? God's already worked it out. He already knew what he was going to do. In retrospect, when Abraham was taking Isaac up the mountain, God already knew that there was going to be a ram in the bush. He already knew what he was going to do. But he asked questions to test you. I came here to prophesy to somebody. We can just go home and the fact that God already knows what he's going to do. This is why some of you should just go to sleep because you can trust that God is in control and he already knows what he's going to do. How do you know, Pastor? Because I'm a living witness of what God can do do when I'm lost he's always found when I'm weak he's always strong always knows what he's going to do and this is what John is communicating to us that no matter where you find yourself in life in a dry place without any resources Jesus already knows what he's going to do Selah So let's look at this. I'm going to give you some points so you know that I studied and we tried to be theologically sound. Here it is. God works first without reservations. I love the text because when I see the text, I start seeing God as the chef chef or the chief. I realize that he works without reservations. This crowd, he did not invite them to come follow him. This crowd runs after him because they see he's healing the sick. He's restoring Israel, and they want more of him. And so Jesus understands that there's some pressure that comes when God is using you mightily. And so this uninvited crowd shows up, but I'm grateful that Jesus does not get an attitude like some of the disciples suggest and turn them away. Because Jesus allows walk-ins. 
And that's good news for those who may not even be a member of Evangel Fellowship. Some of you just pulled up today and said, God, I need something from you, but God will serve you without a reservation. Some of you came to Jesus just as you were because God will serve you without a reservation. You don't need a tie. You don't need a jacket. You don't need anything but to show up. Some of you are going to get blessed today for just showing up. Aren't you glad that you can show up without a reservation? Because some of you call God in office hours, but some of you've learned how to call God late in the midnight hour because you know you can show up without reservations. And the Bible says you can come boldly before the throne of grace. Look at somebody say, just pull up, just pull up, just pull up. That's modern day vernacular for just show up. Jesus did not invite this crowd to come. They show up. But when you're a chef, when you're a chief, you know how to serve people that don't have reservations. There was a woman with the issue of blood while Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house that did not have a reservation. But Jesus knows how to deal with customers that don't have a reservation. Can I prophesy to somebody? That this week in your business, don't you turn away people you didn't expect to show up. Because God's about to bless you in an unexpected way. It won't be your usual customers. It won't be your usual supporters. God's going to pull somebody out of nowhere and cause them to walk in your somewhere. Because sometimes unexpected provision shows up as unexpected problems. Do you have an appointment? No, but I got an anointing. That's why if you got an administrator, you better make sure they have the spirit of discernment. Because sometimes it's beyond an appointment, it's an anointing. And what I've been praying for is knocking on my door, opening. Peter didn't have an appointment while the church was praying and they almost missed the miracle because they wouldn't open the door. But Jesus will serve you without a reservation. Can I help you? You don't have to wait to Sunday for him to touch your life. Pastor, if I can just make it a Sunday. I know You may not make it this Sunday. You got to learn how to just pull up when you need him the most. Because he's a very present help in the time of trouble. You can pull up without reservation. How do you know when you read John chapter 3 before we get to John chapter 6? There's a person by the name of Nicodemus that just pulls up. He's Nick at night, doesn't have a reservation. And he begins to ask Jesus some questions. And Jesus says, except you be born again, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Because we serve a God that can meet you at the point of your need. In fact, he looks beyond your faults and ministers to your need. I don't know why y'all got me so hype on the first point. We serve a God that will serve you without a reservation. Because I've been to some restaurants that are bougie. Even when it's empty, they ask, do you have a reservation? All these empty seats, I don't need a reservation. Sometimes ushers act like that. Do you have a reservation? Just sit them down. If Jesus can serve without reservations, then we too must be able to serve without reservation. I didn't say without orders. I said without reservation. Somebody call you and say, I need you to meet me here because I need your help. Do you have to have a three-week notice? Or can you show up without a reservation? Because if you want a spontaneous blessing, sometimes you got to do some spontaneous service. I'm booked for 2024. Check with me in 2025. But as we become more like Jesus, we begin to serve those who don't have 
reservation. Because you don't know who you're meeting on the way to your meeting. Maybe that's why they pass the man who's on the side of the road because they had a reservation at the temple. And they couldn't serve the man that was on the road side of Jericho because he didn't have a reservation. But God's about to disrupt your normal course of schedule. Because sometimes the miracle is on the way to what you perceive to be a miracle. They missed it. Okay. God serves without reservation. Second, he serves with a recipe. So without reservation and with the recipe. Pull up. But God's not just putting things together off the top of his head. He's got a recipe. See, I, I love recipes because old school chefs, people that can really cook, they really don't write anything down. That's why some of y'all like, God, keep grandma because if grandma leave with all those recipes... Thanksgiving is going to be terrible. <laughs> Grandma leave is potluck now. <laughs> because grandma kept it all right here. But my cousin Went to Cincinnati. My cousin, one of my cousins, won't tell you which one it is, likes to eat. He went to Cincinnati because I have a grandmother that's 96 years old. She, she lives in Ohio. And if you ever want to get a theological dissertation on love, just call her. She knows everything there is to know about love. You want to know how to make your marriage work? Love. You want to know how to grow your church? Love. You want to know how to get your money right? Love. The answer to everything is love when you call my grandma. You want to know how to be a good child? Love. You want to know how to make good grades? Love. Make some money? Love. I always know what the answer is going to be before I ask her. The answer is always love. So my grandmother is 96 years old. She lives in Cincinnati, and my cousin likes to eat. And he realized my grandmother's getting older. And I pray God will give her longer life. She's already winning, but even more. So he took his wife with him to Cincinnati, Ohio. Again, I'm not telling you which cousin this is. Take, took her to Cincinnati. And he said, I want you to sit at the feet of my grandmother, and I want you to get the recipe for this and that. And so he took a picture of my cousin writing down the recipe so that she could duplicate it in North Carolina. You still don't know what cousin I'm talking about. So she could duplicate it in the state she's from. All right. And, and so... What happened is she started writing it down, and it started reminding me that maybe God operates the same way. That God has a recipe in his mind, and that's why he used 40 authors, over 66 books, to sit there and write down his recipe for victory. To write down his recipe for success. To write down his recipe for forgiveness. To write down his recipe for deliverance. And the reason he wrote it down so we wouldn't forget it. Because he said the same results I get, I want you to have too. Matter of fact, greater work shall you do because I gave you my recipe. And that wasn't enough just to have my recipe because the law killeth the law. I'm going to give you my spirit. So what my recipe book won't teach you, my spirit will. God uses a recipe. This is not happenstance. He doesn't go and get Kraft macaroni and cheese. No, he puts it in the oven. He bakes it. God has a recipe. He doesn't reach into a freezer. He has a recipe, and he makes everything from scratch. 
you'll get that on the way home. I said, he makes everything from scratch. He is the creator. Everything that was made, he created. Nothing is store-bought. That's what they should have understood because he asked them a question to test them. He said, where can we buy some bread? If Philip knew who he was talking to, he would have known he was talking to the creator of bread. Before there was a grocery store, there was an I am. And this is the problem. Some of you pray and don't know who you're talking to. If you knew you were talking to a real grocery store in person, you wouldn't have been worried about finding a grocery store outside of me because everything you need is found in me. Because Adam and Eve ate when there was no grocery store. Because there was a God that provided all their needs. How do we become more dependent on the resource than the source? Because we've forgotten who we're talking to. Amen. Amen. He doesn't just say, I give bread. He says, I am the bread. He doesn't say, I give life. He says, I am the life. He doesn't say, I just give resurrection. I am the resurrection. I am whoever you need me to be. Not I will do whatever you need me to do. I am whatever you need me to be. And that's why some of us don't pray because we've forgotten who we're talking to. If you knew who you were talking to, you wouldn't be mad at food lion because you serve the lion of Judah. Okay, because you know who you're talking to. Because he asked Philip this question to test him. Because again, this is a comparison between Moses and Jesus. Do you know I'm the one that Moses pointed to? Because if you believe I'm the one that Moses pointed to, you know this is nothing for me. But if you're questioning my identity, we got a big problem. Houston, we've got a problem. I love what Hebrews 10 and 7 says. It says this, then I say, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have Come to do your will, my God. In other words, he said, I came based upon the recipe. I'm going to operate based upon the recipe, and my recipes don't fail. You think God is experimenting with you. He has a recipe. He tells them even when they're in bondage in Jeremiah, he says, I know the plans I have for you. I got a recipe. And I'm going to follow my recipe whether you follow the recipe or not. Because everything I bake is good. That's why I can tell you. And we know all things work together for the good of them that love God and that are called according to his purpose. Because I got a recipe and everything I make is good. In fact, the writer said, taste and see. Not only do I make good food, but if you actually taste me, I'm good too. In fact, when you look in the dictionary and look up good, you've got to see God. Because there's nobody good but God. And so if you follow my recipe, it's going to end good. Because God follows a recipe. And sometimes he needs you to partner with him and follow the same recipe. That's why he tells the cooks, he says, cooks, I need you to start organizing this crowd. We got a big crowd, but I've seen this before. Matter of fact, I saw it before they came here. That they were going to come. And so cooks, I need you to help me to organize this thing because we're going to handle this because I got a recipe. Even though you've never seen it before, I've seen it before. So I got a recipe. We're going to handle this. Because we're not going to let this obstacle cause us to run. Because this is where God gets the most glory. So watch this. He, he, he works without reservations. He works with the recipe. But here's the thing that many of us don't understand. He works in reverse. He works in Reverse. You know, I had to be a little animated, walk backwards. <laughs> he, he works in reverse. This is why it's hard to understand his ways. Watch this. This is what Kierkegaard said. He says, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived 
for. This is why we don't understand his ways, because he's working backwards, and you're walking forward. Let me ask you a question. How would you live your life if you were living it backwards? If you already knew your ending at the beginning, how would you live your life if you were living it backwards? This is why his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts because we start from two different vantage points. I start from the beginning. He starts from the end. So watch this. He finishes it before he starts it. Y'all hear me? He finished it before he started it. This should encourage you that if he started you, he's already finished you. That's why sometimes it seems like God is lying, but that's because of where he's speaking from. He's speaking from the end. You're looking from the beginning. Now, now hear this. He finishes it before he starts it. And watch this because he has a plan. Which means God has thought it through. And planning, watch this, is thinking before moving. Let me say it again so the people in the balcony can hear me. The people online can hear me because I love them online. It says this. He says, thinking before moving is planning. Thinking before moving is planning. So when you're thinking of a master plan... He was thinking before he ever moved on the face of the deep. Before the beginning, there was God. So he was thinking before he started moving. So God never moves without thinking. That's the problem with some of us, that we move without thinking. I just lost it, Pastor. God never just loses it. God, God never just goes off. He always thinks before he moves. Y'all can say what y'all want to say about the lepers. They thought before they busted the move. They said, why should we here? Until we die, we're running out of options. Let's make a move. They thought before they moved. This year, you got to think before you make a move. Jesus said before you start building a house, you got to count up the cost. You got to think before you move. Some of us are moving because of feelings, and feelings are excellent followers, but they're poor leaders. Some of us are in the place we're in, and we're lost because we thought before we moved. Or we didn't think before we moved. What would have happened if you would have thought before you moved? Some of us got some relationships. He don't have a job. He don't have a vision. He got a temper. He's had 10 girlfriends in the last two years. But he's bald and got a beard. Some of us have bad relationships because we haven't thought before we move. This season, you got to be like, God, think before you move. He begins with the end in mind. What is your end going to look like? <laughs> See, watch this. Some of us are in the middle of something like Israel in the wilderness. And yet, God is still at the end. And we need somebody who has a different perspective in our life. See, this is the problem. We got friends, and they all in the middle with us. So we asking opinions of people that's in the same position that we're in. We all stuck in the middle. Stuck in the middle of debt. Stuck in the middle of depression. Stuck in the middle of defeat. And we're asking, what do you think? You, you need somebody who has a different perspective. That's been stuck before, but can stand at the end and say, if you hold your peace and let the Lord fight your battle, he's going to bring you out of that situation. If you keep on paying your bills, if you keep on saving, that debt trap won't hold you that long. You got to have somebody who sees things from a different perspective. 
That even when you feel like you're losing, they can say, I still see a winner on the inside of you because I'm standing from a different perspective. You're not as far back as you think you are. God's about to bring things to pass if you just trust him. The problem is we don't have anybody that can speak from the end. That's all a testimony is, is somebody speaking from the end to people that's in the middle. That's why when your marriage gets rocky, you need to find somebody that's been married as long as you want to be married. That can say this. Yes, we have some infidelity, but infidelity doesn't have to kill your marriage. Yes, we have some financial issues, but financial issues doesn't have to disrupt your marriage. Yes, we have some bad kids like you got some bad kids, but you can stay together. You need somebody at the end that can speak to your middle. I know I can't get no amens because y'all don't want to be real in church. You want to act like your marriage is perfect, but you need somebody at the end that can speak to your middle. You need somebody. When you go through divorce, I know y'all don't believe in divorce. I don't believe in it either, but it happens. That says, listen, God is not through blessing you. I know the church acting like you got a scarlet letter on your chest, but they don't even know why you got a divorce. They don't know you went through domestic abuse, but you keep on walking. And sooner or later, things are going to work in your favor. I'm speaking to you from the end, but I'm speaking to your middle. That's why as soon as somebody says I got a bad doctor's report, I got cancer, I say go talk to somebody on the end. They say I got the same bad doctor's report, but this is what you do. This is how you pray. This is how you believe God. And the same God that brought me out will bring you out. I'm speaking to your middle even though I'm at the end. That's why when the disciples were panicking, Jesus was not. Because he knew what he would do. I'm going to go ahead and give you another revelation because he already saw himself doing it. We say stuff like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Jesus never says that because how can you be at the end and not know what you're going to do? We say stuff like this, I never saw that coming. Jesus never says, I never saw that coming because whatever happens, happens in the middle and he's standing at the end. He doesn't always work on fixed incomes, but he does work on fixed outcomes. Because he's standing at the end, and he works in reverse. So while they was asking about the grocery store, he already saw the 5,000 being fed because he saw the end results. He was just asking the question to test them. And some of you being tested right now, but you got to know that God already knows what he's going to do. Because whoever has the end, you can manipulate the beginning. Whoever is in control of the end can control the beginning. Some of y'all are like, I got a bad life. Right? But your life doesn't have to end bad. This is what Satan got in trouble for. He thought because he can control the middle, Jesus was crucified. He stayed there for three days. But I love Easter. Can I have an Easter moment? I'm looking forward to Easter. <laughs> Jesus said, hold up, player. You may have rights to the middle, but you don't have rights to the end. He said, that's not how the story ends. Three days later. Y'all not trying to have no church. Y'all not trying to have no If you're going to tell my story, tell it right. There's some liberties God gives the enemy in the middle, but he won't give it to him at the end. Have you considered my servant Job? That's middle. But end is double for my trouble. And some of you are discouraged because you're simply in the middle of a wilderness. But the enemy doesn't have rights to your end. Because Jesus makes it very clear that I am the Alpha and I'm the Omega. He never says I'm the middle. But he does say I'll be there with you in the middle. 
Because I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Because I'm a very present help in the time of trouble. Why are you letting somebody dictate your life story when they don't have rights to your ending? People judge you based upon your middle because they haven't read your end yet. Let me leave that alone. Let me leave that alone. Let me move. Even though they were in the middle of a wilderness, Jesus already saw their ending. And he started working backwards. Start working backwards. And sooner or later, if you keep walking forward and he keeps walking backwards, y'all going to have a collision. You know what I'm going to do? I thought this was crazy. Can I just share this with you? I'm going to read my Bible. But I'm not going to start in Genesis. I'm going to see what the Bible sounds like reading from Revelation. And go backwards to Genesis. Isn't it amazing we already had an ending while we're still in the middle? Only the Alpha and the Omega could write the end while we're still in the middle. Look at somebody say, no surprise endings, no surprise endings. It's an expected end. I know some of y'all like thrillers. You like surprise endings. No surprise endings. An expected end. Either y'all quiet or mad. I don't know which one it is. So watch this. He works backwards. And a backward blessing can change your perspective. This is probably the reason that Jesus gives thanks. I don't know if he's giving thanks for what he sees. Or he gives thanks for what he's going to see. <laughs> you hear what I said? I, I don't know if he's giving thanks for what he sees. Or he's thanking God for what he's going to see. Translation. I don't know if he's praising him for the present. Or he's thanking him in advance. See, some of you are stuck in the present. You can just praise God and be thankful for what you can see. But some of us have tapped into an anointing where we can thank God for what we're going to see. We can thank God for the miracles he's going to perform, for the ways he's going to make, for the doors he's going to open. We can thank him for what we're going to see. I might be in a tight place right now, but sooner or later, things are going to shift in my favor. Look at somebody say, I'm going to see his goodness. I'm going to see his goodness while in the land of the living. Can I help you? Y'all bored? I'm trying to help you. You confuse your ending with your middle. Yeah, you confuse your ending with your middle. That's why you're panicking. But you don't have power over my ending. You just play a role in my middle. They're in the middle of the wilderness, and Jesus is not scared because he knows what he's going to do. While you're trying to figure it out, he already worked it out. Can I tell you another story? Yes, sir. You, you know, Walt Disney, Walt Disney, Disney World, Walt Disney, you know. Walt Disney, he was a genius. Anybody who can make a rat famous. <laughs> and you spend your hard-earned money to go see a rodent, something you're trying to kill in your house. <laughs> He's got to be a genius. Put some clothes on him. Give him some character. And you must see Mickey. Not just Mickey, Minnie. He must be a genius to create a character like that in the depression. Because if anything is going to make you more depressed, it's seeing some rats. <laughs> but he's a genius. And you know, he was getting sickly, he was getting older. And I believe one of his last projects was Epcot. 
And they asked Mr. Disney, they said, Mr. Disney, what if you don't live to see Epcot? Mr. Disney responded and said, the only reason you're going to see it is because I saw it. Did y'all hear what I said? Mr. Disney said, the only reason you're going to see it is because I saw it. And God said, the only reason you're going to see my provision is because I already saw it. If you believe that, I need you to give God some glory. If he knows the path that you take. And when you try, you come forth as pure Go, God, I don't know what you're doing in the kitchen, but I know you're prepared. I know you're prepared. And I'll eat up your table even in the wilderness. Everybody stand. Let me give you these last three points while you're standing really quickly. See, when God knows what he's doing, number one, there will be leftovers. When God knows what he's doing. Number two, nothing will be wasted. Because God knows what he's doing doing and third empty things will be filled because God knows what he's doing why if you hear this bow if you hear that you say pastor you know what this message made so much sense I confused my middle with my ending and I grew so discouraged I thought God had turned his back on me that he had left me in the wilderness but I believe God has a future and that he knows what he's going to do with my life. And I realize in order to see the future, the preferred future that he has for me, I need him in my life. That I don't just need what he does for me, I need him. Because all the promises in him are yes and amen.